so a couple years ago, I started a uh, JavaScript meetup group up in Palm Beach Gardens because I wanted to find other nerds around me. And the ideas uh, of uh, the technology desert, uh, I'm messing this up, BuzzJS conference. Um, Take your time, bro. Take your time. I had this all planned out. So we're, we're all about community here, right? We wanted to have uh, a presence and build a tech hub around here. One of the best ways we can do that is bring the technology to the area here. So we started, decided to do this with um, the people over at BuzzJS. And the conference is all about JavaScript from the front end to the back end to the desktop and beyond. Like Joe mentioned, the conference is on October 16th where we have a couple of pretty big headliners. Uh, John Lindquist from Egghead.io is going to be in town, mm -hmm. and uh, Gerard Sands, he's a pretty prolific AngularJS developer. So if you're interested in anything JavaScript related, from the front end to the back end to the desktop and beyond, BuzzJS is your conference to go. On the 17th, we have three uh, workshops that are going to be presented with the BuzzJS conference as well. So if you want to come learn the basics, and back to your fundamentals, I'll be hosting that. If you want to understand the core concepts of Angular, our uh, co-organizer, Daniel Zend, will be taking care of that. And Gerard Sands is going to be bringing us uh, GraphQL from a full stack developer. So there's a lot of opportunities to uh, cover a lot of topics in the JavaScript world, and we look forward to having you. If you want a ticket, our prices are 175 but the early bird is happening soon, uh, or it's going to be ending soon. So. Feel free to sign up before the 15th and get a nice uh, big discount on the, the price. Thank you, guys. And to reiterate, this is all day you get this. You get food. Um, I am also pushing for uh, cookies and brownies. Uh, it's going to be great. Uh, but seriously, I, I know an event like this, not all the names sound uh, familiar, but seriously, some of the best coders and developers and programmers in the JavaScript field in the world are going to come here. One guy I saw was from London even. I mean, it's going to be, huh? Gerard Sands. Yeah. I mean, all coming to downtown West Palm Beach. So if you're interested in this, go to buzzjs.com, check it out, share it with your friends, let them know this is coming. Uh, I told the mayor about this the other day and she was like, oh wow, okay, we're, we're, we're doing something. This is neat to, to have in our backyard. So. We, uh, next up, we're going to have the, uh, the folks from Virtual Badge. I know this this looked a lot better on my computer, but this is Virtual Badge. I apologize, guys. Uh, but they're going to tell you about their startup. They're located right here in West Palm Beach. They work with uh, everybody from the Downtown Development Authority to Florida Power and Light. So, guys, we're, here we go. Oh, here you are. I was looking over here, and I'm like, okay. All right, so give them a round of applause. I'm going to get
regular badge, you can't talk to it, and they can't talk back to you. And so the fourth would be knowing situational awareness. So I'll just go into some ways that we use our product. Uh, the local VA uses virtual badge to issue uh, IDs for exercise that they do. Uh, basically, it avoids having to wait in line to get badged. They don't have to staff somebody on a badging printer or machine. You can just register from the app store, and then they can remotely approve your sign. Uh, so we save basically a ton of time for onboarding. Um, we're actually just about to enter a pretty big deal with uh, the new fingers crossed, but with the volunteer management agency that's nationwide uh, for basically the same purpose. Uh, moving on, uh, we can issue credentials in the badge. Uh, we're entering into a pilot with Abbott Laboratories, the pharmaceutical company, for credentialing their healthcare reps. Basically, our badge can uh, update your health credentials from the cloud, and so uh, keeps them in compliance. It stops people from using their expired badges to enter the facilities. Um, so you can see that's being in compliance. Uh, we do coordination and communication. This is something from uh, directly from our disaster response experience. Um, our main client is Florida Power and Light. They use virtual badge for uh, installing and removing smart lights in the area. So basically, uh, all of the contractors that install assets use virtual badge. Uh, and those contractors uh, are then tied to the work that they do is tied to their identity. And so FPL pays them to do that, and it helps expedite their project management. Um, so we've saved them a ton of money over the last few years. And basically, everyone that started that project has been promoted. Uh, and so, combining all of this together, we do situational awareness. That's really where we came into uh, at disasters. Basically, if all of you wanted to, were, if a hurricane came through and all of you had to go out and do uh, assessments, like finding wounded people, mapping damage out, you download virtual badge, the published County would approve you, and all of the data that you submit is available on a real-time map, as well as your location, if they want to track it. And so uh, the Air Force Academy is one of our clients. They use our app for exercise as well. It's like a essentially Blue Force tracker, but a non-classified version. So they're able to download it from the app store and see where they are. We've helped them with like locating injured cadets and even scoring their exercise. Uh, and so just moving on, uh, the mobile phone market is really huge at this point. Three fourths of people in the U.S. have a smartphone every day. Everyone loses ID cards. No one really wants to lose their smartphone, so it kind of makes sense to have virtual badge rather than uh, plastic ID card systems. And you don't have to have anything else other than a smartphone to use our system. You don't have to print anything. I mean, you can if you want. We offer that, but it's totally electronic if you need. Uh, we're a SaaS product uh, because of that to expand services with us, uh, call us for support, you don't have to do it internally. Uh, and ultimately, we're cheaper than buying a batching system if you do that out of the time. Uh, and so that's basically our company. Uh, we have seven patents. Uh, we're located locally. And uh, we have a little video that we can play for you that kind of explains a little more about how our product works. Does your badge include entry access? And it doesn't open doors yet, it's something that we're working on. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple other people. Yeah, we're pretty small. I'm not a CEO one. That's me. That's John. Our CEO one of the good. was able to make it. We actually have some uh, government representatives from Nigeria coming next week. Uh, Joe's actually going to be meeting with them. But uh, we're negotiating a five-year contract to help clean up the largest oil spill in the entire world. So they have to send some government representatives to check on our business to make sure that we're legitimate. And so they're going to be here with the, the mayor's meeting with them. Are you based in West Palm Beach? Yeah. Downtown? Yeah. Or? We're near Good Samaritan. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Our CEO is Scott Lewis. Uh, <laughs> so are there a lot other competitors uh, in this place? There's a few that do parts of our solution. Uh, there's one that's really, really well funded, but it's more uh, oriented towards opening doors than ours. Yeah, I'm not 
think the solution can do is, if, if I'm a high school administrator and I want to track the visitors, I can do an instant background check and know where they all, all, all are on campus at all times. Yeah, we've, we've been expanding into a bunch of different industries besides disaster response. Um, we have a museum in Tampa that's using this now for members. We're talking with a few banks. Just go to the settings. Go to the settings and change the sound to your computer. Yeah, back to the back to yeah, get back. Yeah. 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 Teamwork, guys. And we'll help your business to make better decisions. Enables businesses to connect with the people that matter to them by leveraging the power of modern smartphones to connect identity management with data collection. Virtual Badge lets businesses issue electronic ID cards directly to the smartphones of employees, contractors, visitors, and more. Requesting an ID badge has never been easier. Users skip long lines, and businesses can ensure that the right people have access to their sensitive information. Virtual Badge can be used to gather valuable information from people that interact with your business, even if they don't have a smartphone. Rapid enrollment into the software takes only a few moments and can be done anywhere at any time. For users that do have a smartphone, checking them into your business to track their actions helps improve engagement with customers and will help your business make better decisions. User data is collected directly from the mobile app and this process creates a log in your control center for later analysis. Businesses can use this data to improve customer experiences tailor marketing campaigns, and get to know the people that use your services. Virtual Badge features electronic forms that can be quickly customized to replace traditional paper documentation, greatly improving the timeliness and accuracy for managing critical information. These forms are available in your control center to analyze and make better decisions. It takes less time and effort to collect information on a smartphone, and this data greatly improves business intelligence for the modern workforce. Analysis of this data can be done in the control center and will enable businesses to visualize trends in customer and employee habits. For employees and contractors, virtual badge can be used to view the real-time and historic location of users as they interact with your business. Virtual badge is changing the way that businesses engage with employees and clients to improve the way that they make decisions. For more information about Virtual Badge, please visit our website at www.virtualbadge.com. And we all had some time for questions, but um, you know, a key thing you can do is pull out your phone right now and actually download this for one and check it out. But uh, for those of you that want to learn more, we'll send out an update um, after the meetup for everybody who signed in, and we'll send out some uh, some information on these guys. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. So uh, next up, uh, we have uh, probably the most dapper looking guy here today, Ike Anderson. He's going to tell you about his company, again, right here in West Palm Beach, Upstart Internet Marketing. Everybody give Ike a round of applause. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hello everyone. Hello. Awesome. Uh, just want to take a quick poll. Uh, how many students are there in the room tonight? Raise your hands. Awesome. How many... Uh, Programmers, developers, front-end developers, people in the IT world. Awesome. How many entrepreneurs, business owners, handle staff, employees, day-to-day -day operations? Hands up. Awesome. And who, how many people are here just to drink beer and have a good time? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm uh, what you would call a uh, I can't even put a word to it. Serial entrepreneur. So, uh, 
someone that always looking for opportunities and, and things that I can do to make a difference. And one of the companies I started is Upstart Internet. And we're a digital marketing agency. And we work primarily with plastic surgeons and attorneys throughout the country. And it's pretty much what we do, it's digital marketing. But Joe asked me to come in tonight and talk about my company. But there's something within me that, like, who wants to listen to someone talk about digital marketing? Um, and how does it really impact you? So I decided that there's something that impacted my life 15 years ago that woke me up that made me decide that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. That made me decide that I wanted to do something bigger and greater with my life. So, is it okay to talk about that real quick? Yeah. 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 So, show of hands, who grew up hearing, go to school, get a good job, do really good in school, put your hands up, and then when you graduate, you're gonna go to college, then you're gonna leave college, you're gonna have an amazing career, and then you'll be happy. Uh, you heard that? So that's what I grew up with. Go to school, get a good job, graduate, and everything will be perfect. But did all that and I realized I wasn't happy. I talked to clients every day on the phone and I realized that they're really not happy. <laughs> You've had that experience, right? Mm -hmm. It happens. 15 years ago I asked myself those questions and I decided that something had to change and I was just in a bad state. And this all ties into business, guys, because how you live your life and how you operate is how you treat your clients. It's, it's how you fulfill on your projects. It's just how you show up in them everyday life. Would you agree? Yes. I can't hear you guys. You agree? Yes. Yes. Awesome. So my grandmother, she taught me by telling me stories. And she saw the look in my face. It's not even good space. She said, I let's have a talk. Usually when she says let's have a talk, it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, so I sat and she told me the story. Do you want to hear the story? Yes. Yes, I like that. It's about an eagle that laid four eggs. It was a windy, windy day, and one of the eggs fell out the nest. The chicken farmer was walking home, and he saw the egg. He stopped and he picked it up. Nice big egg. It wasn't like a chicken egg. So he took it home, and he wrestled it under his hand with the other eggs, and decided to leave the egg there. Weeks went by, and the eggs started to hatch. And ultimately, an eagle was born amongst a few chickens. That eagle grew up with the chickens. He had chicken food. He quacked like a chicken, if quick as the chickens quacked. He uh, walked around like a chicken, and he felt proud as a chicken. One day, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, nice cloudy day, when he, he looked up and he saw some eagles flying, some birds flying, and he said, hey mom, what are those? He said, those are eagles, huh? He's like, eagles, why are they doing so far up? He's like, we're chickens, we stay in here, we don't fly, we master the ground, and sit well with them. Eventually, he started seeing the eagles more often. There's this thing called the prefrontal cortex. You ever thought about you wanted a, a car, a certain car, and then you see it, then you see it everywhere. <laughs> he started seeing those eagles every single day. And within his heart, he says, I'm gonna fly. He told his little front chickens that he hatched with them, grew up with, hey, I'm gonna fly. They're like, no, mom says we're chickens, we don't fly. <laughs> Eventually he started flapping his wings and started taking off, but didn't go anywhere. Because subconsciously, he's a chicken. One day, like three weeks later, he saw another eagle, and they made an eye contact. And he said, hey, you're like me. Let's fly. He flapped his wings and took off and started flying. And he went up, and he went up, and he went up. Imagine a 16-year-old boy hearing that story that's in a very bad state. That woke me up. 
They go back to sleep ever since. We're eagles. We're meant to fly. We were meant to be creators. We were meant to do great things. When we add those in our heart, that mindset, there's really no limitation that's on this planet. There's no limitation to how we deal with our clients. There's no limitation to how we show up for a family and how we do things. So I just wanted to share that story with you guys because Joe, you've created an amazing environment mm -hmm. where collectively we can come here and collaborate and work together. The last four employees that I hired came directly from Joe. Problem hiring good talent locally. Thanks for that. Creating the environment. So that's what we're here for, guys. It's to talk about technology, to create an impact, to create a move forward momentum where we're helping and supporting each other. Because that's what we're here for, right? Yes. Is that why we're here? Yes. yes. Absolutely. So thanks for hearing me out tonight, and I hope whatever I said resonated somewhere. Yeah. And this guy, if you'd love to hear more about him, he's got a podcast. It's called Upstart Hustle. You can find it on YouTube. Can, is it on? Uh, Watching next week on the iTunes store. Watching next week on the iTunes store. So we're going to share out that information. Come on, give this guy a little. So next up, we're going to have uh, our keynote speaker uh, for this evening. And um, for those of you that have never heard of or uh, seen Felicia Hatcher, you're in for a real treat. There are a few people in this state that do as much for the next generation of entrepreneurs, technology, uh, the technologists and, and founders, really, uh, than Felicia. You know, she, as a, a few years ago, started a company um, and I heard her speak probably about two years ago uh, at an entrepreneur luncheon and was blown away. Uh, you know, turn the clock, you know, a couple of years later and, you know, we're, we're talking about how we can better impact the world around us together. And that's really a special thing because when you find people in this world that are saying, you know, we got to figure out what we can do for the people around us and how we can impact the world in the most positive way possible, you know you've found some really special people. Uh, and we uh, had the, the pleasure of going to Kansas City together for the Coffin Foundation's Entrepreneur Summit a couple months ago. And, um, you know, we, we were able to uh, share some time and share some stories back and forth. Uh, and uh, we also found this amazing jazz club in Kansas City, <laughs> let me tell you. But, um, you know, she does a lot of great work. She's been featured uh, on some great local uh, organizations, the South Florida Business Journal, Miami Herald, and she just spoke at TEDx Fargo even. So everyone, please welcome a round of applause, Felicia. <laughs> Uh, I was on the ground for a pretty long time, 
And two ideas came to mind. So one, I'm way too old to chase after an ice cream truck. <laughs> and why doesn't anyone come up with a cooler way for adults to enjoy ice cream? And so you know what happens when you fall, right? You kind of, what do you do? Huh? Before you get back up. You look to the left and you look to the right. <laughs> But that was not over aha And so we work with a lot of entrepreneurs with the work that we do. And I often tell them sometimes a good paying job will stand in the way of you following your dreams just as much as a bad paying job. Um, and sometimes it takes people a while to understand what that means. But when you have something deep down inside that you want to start, like you can't let things get in your way. And sometimes a really big paycheck will get in the way, right? But you realize you start compromising things that are not in alignment with who you are and how you want to put your gifts out into the world. And so I work for some really amazing companies. Uh, we work for Nintendo on the product launch side. I work for Sony as a Southeast Regional Manager for them. I work for Little Debbie Snap Cakes. <laughs> yes, the Key Foods. Uh, back in the early days when they were trying to get their whole social media act together, it was my job to manage a team and travel around collecting a million smiles. It sounds really cool. It was crazy as all get out, um, but a lot of fun. And so very early days in the social media space, uh, working with the marketing team, launching products, launching the Wii Fit, and the Wii Fit, yes. and the Wii Sports Resort, that game. Uh, Sony and the ebook reader. Does anyone remember that? It was supposed to be the iPad, but we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> Actually, we should talk about it, right? <laughs> because Sony missed the ball so many times, right? They had the MP3 player before Apple. Right. And it's a very important lesson for small businesses because they had the idea and no one on the team wanted to jeopardize their job to say, this should be our next move. And what happened? We're like Sony and what? Sony and the tablet? Like, we don't even know what that is anymore. Right? Or the MP3 player. And so, some really important lessons, and I could go on and on and on about that. But I had this idea after, like I said, falling down, chasing after this ice cream truck. And I sat on the idea for two years. And I often tell people, like, I could have created, like, the Pinterest with all the shit that I collected. <laughs> I tried to convince myself that I should, like, follow the tree. Every website I could find, every other ice cream company I could find, like, you name it, I was, like, collecting all of it, right? Like, the, literally, like, the bad lady. And it wasn't until I lost my job in 2008, when the economic downturn happened, when a lot of people lost their jobs that it literally forced me to say, let me see where this idea is going to go. Mm -hmm. And if I, I swear to you, if I could have found another job at that time, I would not be standing here in front of you. And so timing is also really important when we're talking about launching our dreams. And I decided, I said, let's just see where this idea is going to go. Moved back to Florida. Uh, and not only moved back to Florida, I moved back with my husband to my parents' house. Yeah, it, it just gets worse and worse and worse, right? You're like, where is she going with this? And literally everything that people tell you that you need to have stacked up in order to start a business, I had none of those things. Like, I thought it was opposite day. I, I don't know what's going on. Do you remember that, like, back in, back in the day in, like, elementary middle school? I had none of those things. I just could not let go of this idea. Because one, I love desserts. I love desserts so much that my husband and I got married at a hippie donut shop in Portland, Oregon. You know what? If you're a blue channel fanatic, you know the place I'm talking about. It was literally the best time of our lives. Uh, we were trying to plan a living in Minnesota at the time, trying to plan a wedding in Florida. It just didn't work out. We decided to elope, vote Voodoo Donuts, had weddings on the menu. So we were just like, why not? 200 bucks, we get married, we get a platter of donuts, and let's just do it. Thing, right? <laughs> and the funny part of that, about that is after we got married, we literally went and did laundry. <laughs> so, but I love, you can tell that I love desserts, right? Um, and so I started this company with the last bit of our savings. 
going to the luxury shopping website Craigslist, <laughs> and buying these two ice cream carts off of Craigslist, not even having enough money to professionally wrap and wrap these carts. Like, well, I'm an entrepreneur, like, right? What do we do? We figure things out. We may turn something out of nothing. Let me go to Home Depot. Buy spray paint. Yes, it, I tell you these stories just get worse. And worse. <laughs> Buy spray paint. Get decals that are supposed to go on the wall. Like these would look really good on an ice cream cart, right? Buy and literally in my parents' backyard, we are spray painting ice cream carts um, and putting decals and just trying to make something happen. And it was before like the whole lean startup and all this stuff. So like it was our MVP. And I was just like, I just need to see where this idea is gonna go. It's this crazy idea. Let me just see where it's gonna go and then I'll move on, right? When the when the economy like turns over. And so when I say like timing plays an important role when you're talking about following your dreams and innovation and creativity and like all of that stuff. It, we started in a time where there weren't a lot of opportunities, right? Everyone was like registering into like this economic downturn and this recession. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not registering for that. Like I don't have to participate in that, right? One way or another, the line fit. And the whole DIY culture was like sprouting up, which was an extremely important tool for us, essentially. Because the whole DIY, like do-it-yourself culture, meant that people were creating things, but moreover, people were buying things that had little imperfections. Because one, they felt like, hey, that's like that's an original, right? Mm -hmm. And it's okay that the string is hanging off of this T-shirt, or the button just fell off of this purse. I'm the only one that has this. <laughs> moreover, because of everything that was going on people were searching for a deeper connection to the products that they were buying. So they liked the fact that they could talk to the owner about where they got that sheepskin from or whatever, right? Or the fact that they make their own rice milk in their garage or, yeah, it's random, because it was a random time, right? I don't mean your face. But we appreciated that. That time worked really well for someone that was in their parents' backyard with cars that they bought off of Craigslist and saying, I'm going to sell ice cream and like pedal my way to popsicle success. Like, it worked for us. And, but that's essentially what we did. I had to see where this idea is going to go. And so when you talk about entrepreneurship and innovating and ecosystem building and all that stuff that we do, it literally starts with an idea, it starts with some passion, but it starts with a hell of a lot of grit. And most importantly, going out there and testing and testing and testing over and over and over again. And so everything that we would have we accomplished with with um with feverish pops were those early days like failure and experimenting and taking recipes from when Derek was five years old on a farm in Bakers, Georgia, and you know going to an Indian restaurant and having a mango latte and said this would be fantastic as a popsicle and who turns peanut butter and jelly sandwiches into popsicles but that was like one of our top sellers and moreover. Alcohol in popsicles, like, why didn't this exist prior to us? <laughs> and we did all that, and we experimented, and we started from my parents' backyard. And the funny thing about my parents, my dad's an entrepreneur. He owns a company called Hatcher Construction and Development in, in Delray. My mom is a lifelong educator. She's a teacher and a college professor, has more degrees than, you know, she can spread that out through, through our entire family. And my parents have always supported our, my brother and I are creativity, right? They always supported it. I was in the popsicle business. My brother's a stand-up comedian and like a content producer. And you're just like, how, how does that even go together, right? Very interesting childhood, but a fun childhood. But again, going back to how we support entrepreneurs, allowing them the creative space to be creative and be able to make mistakes. And I remember my parents, like, it was the first time in my entire life where they just, they were just like, know about this. <laughs> they never said it, but it was just the way that they looked at me. Not when I rolled up with the carts, the two carts from Craigslist, but when I decided to go back to Craigslist and roll up with a Chevy P30 ice cream truck that was about 40 years old. It was at that time, they're like, oh, I don't really know. Uh, but support, and having a support system and moreover, understanding the lane that you play, right? And so 
I don't know if anyone's in the frozen dessert industry, but it's extremely cutthroat. Like, extremely cutthroat. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't sound like that. Whist bells and whistles and ice cream truck music and all that stuff. Extremely cutthroat. And we were going out in the day, and like, very territorial, right? Just like, what are you doing here? I've been serving this elementary school for 40 years. Get off my block. <laughs> And we were just like, we don't know what to do. We know the kids have ice cream. And it was that area of like opportunity that we figured out when we looked at who we were and what we'd like to do and realized that no one was targeting adults and no one was going out of that. And then that became literally our sweet spot. And like marketing 101, right? Like you can't be number one or number two in a specific like industry or vertical. You have to create a space where you can be number one, right? Niches, right? Coca-Cola's number one, Pepsi's number two, who the hell is number 17? Does anyone know, right? Energy drinks is in that same category. Red Bull became number one in that industry because they became the leader of what industry? Or what vertical? Energy drinks. Huh? Energy drinks, right? So same thing, going out at night. So make a long story short about uh, feverish because I want to get into the work that we do in tech. Um, I have more failure stories than I, we have time for. Right? And so when you talk about supporting entrepreneurs, creating an environment that embraces failure. People don't really understand that. My parents definitely don't understand that. Failure, you don't ever fail. Right? Because you experiment, you iterate. You are in spaces like this that, that cultivate like that kind of experience. Um, and it's very forgiving when you fail and was wrapped around the right resources so that you quickly and easily bounce back into your next venture. Right? Feverish Pops, uh, featured in the cooking channel, featured on the Today Show, we sold millions of popsicles. Uh, we had a warehouse of uh, manufactured popsicles and, and sold them all across the, the nation. Private label manufacturing, Google, PayPal, Forever 21, Cadillac, Universal Records, uh, Capital Records, a lot, like a Fortune 500 client list that would make your head spin with popsicles. And all of that came from us really realizing getting the hell away from elementary school, <laughs> targeting adults, but then leaning back on our experience working with tech companies and marketing companies, wrapping that up into an experience. And this day and age, if you were running a company and you're not creating an experience, your company's going to die. Right? And so I often tell people I was able to steal from the big boys when I worked for the NBA and um, Nintendo and Sony and all these companies. We were spending all this money on research and development. My guy was around here somewhere that was doing that presentation. They are spending all that money on research and development to find out that exact thing, that they have to create an experience. And then social media came on and it's even more of an experience. How do we get people to take what we're doing and take that message viral? How do we get them to share? How do we capture their, their social capital and turn that into an engine that, that fuels what we're doing? We learned that all on a ramen noodle budget and we deployed that all on a ramen noodle budget with our food company. Um, we were uh, awarded, I think it was in 2011, one of the top 100 entrepreneurs under the age of 30 uh, at the White House. Um, and when we had this warehouse in Little Haiti, we ran a store in the Midtown area of Miami. Um, but we were employing kids from the Little River City and Overtown area. And we knew that they weren't going to be impossible forever. We were like perfectly fine with that. But we wanted to equip them with the skills that we thought would make them most marketable to really be competitive in, in here, in, not just here in the state, but across the globe. And we, what we know, and we all know for sure, is that our, edu our education system is not equipped to make our students competitive, and that's a problem. And every year we continue to push them into a system that we know is failing them. And I know there's educators in the room, I'm the daughter of an educator, I debate my mom with this all the time, but I know my experience. I was a C student in high school, uh, my guy has told me to never make it to college or university, proceeded to not help me. But I was also one of those kids that could rewire cable into my bedroom. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and here. Uh, I taught myself how to code when I was in high school. I ended up winning $130,000 in scholarships and grants with a GPA that you never touch a 3.0. Like, maybe on the way down, but definitely like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know what my experience is getting very creative with limited resources, and that became pretty much the mantra of my life and why I'm going to work with you. Long story short, we sold Feverish, uh, got, well, got out of a really crazy investor deal, sold Feverish, 
um, had started Code Fever in between that and decided to take that full time. Full time. And so when we started Code Fever, Miami startup ecosystem was just sprouting up. Um, and it was not inclusive. So there weren't really any programming for women. And then when you talk about the African American and Caribbean community in Miami, there wasn't none of those things, none of those three things were really a part of the conversation. So they weren't at the tables. They weren't even on the menus, right? We all know like that whole thing, right? It was a non-factor, and that's a problem. And so when we talk about building very resilient cities and resilient communities and building competitive cities and competitive communities and innovation hubs and innovation districts, when we talk about all that and we're not building solutions that include the entire population, there's a problem. Because what happens is we are looking at these groups and we're looking at them initially for their challenges and not their contributions and their contributions that they've always had to the innovation economy. Let me give you some examples. And so you look at, my mom's from Jamaica and when we used to go there, uh, we'll still go there, They're, they have the Jitney taxis, right? No, the Judah taxis, right? In Little Haiti, they have something called the Jitney taxi. And so we all know, because it took us two hours to get here today, the major transportation issues that we have in Miami, but the infrastructure issues around transportation that we have around the state. Um, and there are companies like the Jitney taxi in Little Haiti that have provided a solution to that. Right? People pay, I think, $2 now to go from point A to point B, People pile in these vans. And so the same utility is really not even the equal. Right? This company has been around for 30 years. Uber, I think, has been around for seven. And so if we're not looking in diverse communities, or if, you, if you're not looking in diverse communities, you could have been 23 years ahead. So think of it as an investor, right? Think of it, think of it as local and um, state policy and government and what we can do to better support our entrepreneurs. And when you could have found that solution 23 years ago, but because we're not looking into these communities because we don't think that they add any value into the innovation economy, that's a problem. Another fun example, church on Sundays, right? The preacher does a really good job. And you know where he's coming, right? He's just like, he's killing it, saying all the right things, and they do what? Pass the plate, right? And so every Sunday across the United States, for generations, these churches have been crowdfunded. Every single Sunday, right? Building funds. Every Sunday, they crowdfund. And a dollar at a time, they're able to do whatever they do, right? We can have all the other conversations about that. They crowdfund every Sunday. In the Caribbean community, we call that partner. In the African community, for hundreds of years, that was called SUSU, right? And so the utility, again, of crowdfunding platforms like Indiegogo and Kickstarter and the funeral funding platform called GoFundMe, right? We all know, yeah, anyways. <laughs> These things have been around for generations. And again, if we're looking at things as, a, as from the lens of opportunity as opposed to need, we'll start going into these communities and funding these ideas at the early on. And these are huge opportunities that we now know are global companies that have global impact. But we have to make sure that we are valuing our diverse populations for the contributions that they've always given to our communities. But at the same time, we also have to make sure that we are equipping these communities so that they can add value into the innovation economy. Because at this present time, a lot of them are being consumed by the technology industry. So we talk a lot about how they consume technology more than we create, but we don't really talk about how these companies are consuming people in our community. And a lot of that we see every day and we don't really understand that. In the instances of service workers, and so technology companies can talk all day long about the diversity issues, and not just the major technology companies, there's a lot that our startups can be doing as well on a local level. 
to make sure that we appreciate and we're acknowledging and we're hiring and we're training and we're contributing to a diverse and competitive population. But these companies are consuming them. We see them as service workers. So we'll see these companies come to an area, right? And they can't really figure out how to find the people or find the neighborhoods when they need to hire them for C-suite positions, when they need to hire them for procurement, um, not hire them, but for procurement and contract opportunities. But when I need to find a driver or a post needs delivery person or a handy person to clean my house, I all of a sudden know exactly where to go. And that's a problem, right? I played basketball for, for most of my life. I didn't make it to the WNBA, but I worked for them as a front office marketing manager, so I take that as a win, right? So I played basketball. Our team sucked. I went to Atlantic High School. It's a whole other story. But <laughs> my basketball coach would always say, you're only as strong as your weakest player. Right? And so we have to look at our communities. We have to look at the tools that we're creating in our communities. We have to look at the programs that we're building and how can we make sure that we are rising up our weakest players. We started Code Fever as a coding startup school for African American and Caribbean students four years ago to address the needs that I just talked about, to make sure that our students were competitive, to give their parents a better understanding of what was going on in the ecosystem and show them the role that they play in the ecosystem. One of the biggest differences between um, our coding program and some other coding programs is, is culture and confidence play an extremely big role. And how tech is introduced to students plays a major role, right? Especially when we're talking about marginalized groups. And so we really spend the whole first week, almost two weeks, right, right? Focus on mindset. They very rarely touch a computer the first week or so. Because if they don't understand the role that they play in the tech industry, nothing that we teach them really matters. If I can't see someone that looks like me that has succeeded in that space, mm -hmm. what you're teaching me doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how I fit in. I don't understand how this applies to me. And so it's really important when we talk about technology and training uh, ecosystems that you're thinking about diversity from the very beginning. But showing all groups the amazing innovators that exist in this space. Here's some local companies here that are really cool. Right? When we talk about Palm Beach and what we can do here, a lot of them actually come to Miami and come to the things that we do, right? Uh, Junior Alexis with, um, oh my gosh, you kill me if I forgot to stretch. Direct Dispatch, right? The guys in Nerd Alert. There's some really cool things going on here in Palm Beach. So how do we create an ecosystem that supports diverse entrepreneurs? At the same time, how do we make sure that what we're doing in the startup and tech space does not alienate our, our traditional small businesses. How do we help them become more tech enabled, right? Some of the businesses in our community still don't use that credit cards, right? That's a problem. And that's not because all of them are not legit, right? <laughs> you know the Panama Papers are real, like, don't agree with that, right? But some of them lack basic technology infrastructure that can mean light and day for these companies. And so as we are building, because everyone always looks to Silicon Valley as like that, that seal of approval of what they're trying to create. And when you look to them to create that, you not only believe the good, you believe the bad. That there's some really amazing legs that we can stand on here in South Florida, the a different picture, but have a much greater impact, right? It's connecting the dots between the resources. It's looking at everyone and how they can contribute. Making sure when we are in rooms that they should look like this. Look how beautiful this room looks, mm -hmm. right? And how all of us can contribute to the success of a really strong and impactful ecosystem. But also solving problems quicker and faster than before because that's what technology allows. We started Coach Fever, Coach Fever was great. We realized that you cannot just train students you cannot just equip parents with the knowledge of understanding what their kids are doing in the next room. You also have to make sure that all the tools to support startup founders are within arm's reach. Right? Training is just not enough. And so we created Black Tech Group. 
Uh, we're actually going into the third year of that. It's October 7th through the 7th. Of Right, shameless plug. <laughs> Anyone wants to come? Um, as a, as a, in the beginning, it was simply this, right? If not any week in South Florida, if not any week, we would curate a week that provided every opportunity, every resource that you could possibly need as a diverse startup founder. You would find it in that week. That was our goal, right? And then we set up to set out to find some of the most brilliant people all over the globe in order to make that happen, right? Um, our first year we had almost about a thousand participants in the entire week, right? So there's a conference which gets most of the attention. There's all this community work and community events that take place during the entire week. Uh, last year we had a little over 1,600 participants in the entire week. Um, it's been featured on Forbes and uh, Inc. and like all over the place. Really great experience. But we had some really badass speakers too, right? Uh, and so Roni Adamitz, the founder of Magic Leap, I think like refused to speak at anything prior to Black Tech Week. He was a speaker last year. He made a diversity hire commitment that we're working on with them right now, which is really cool. Uh, the founder of Priceline was one of our speakers. Uh, this earlier this year, we launched Black Tech Weekend. Um, Michael Seibel, the CEO of Y Combinator, was our keynote speaker. We had about 400 people there with a wait list of 300 other people. We just literally had nowhere to put people. Uh, the room looked just like that. <laughs> Mentor sessions, right? Digital literacy class for senior citizens. Uh, Black History what, Month happened on, huh? Uh, and then we launch a VC and residence program, right? And so when I talk about finding solutions, having problems, and finding really easy solutions, why do you figure out the rest? That's literally been the story of our life with Code Fever. So hackathons, coding boot camps, working on the training side, but then an ecosystem needs to support that, right? And so filling in the gap between the ecosystem, so entrepreneurs could then actually become the hiring partners for our young people. Yeah. Because a study came out, Harvard study came out that said, if you want to solve the issue with the um, with hiring young people, you first have to increase the number of startups that are founded by people of color and marginalized groups. Because they are more than likely to hire people that look just like them, mm -hmm. right? And so we know that more women in C-suite positions and that are CEO of companies you see a huge influx as soon as they start working there, as soon as they take those positions of more women in those companies. We know when we see African Americans in C-suite and, and, and higher positions, you see an influx in this diverse hiring, right? We, do, we know that. And so if you want to increase the number of students that are hired so that nonprofits in the grassroots tech hiring space, tech training space, can move away from the train and pray model, right? <laughs> we train people and we pray that there's a job for them on the other end. We have to support our entrepreneurs and our startups and our techies here, strengthen them so that they can be the direct hiring partners for these organizations. If we don't do that, I don't know what's going to happen to our coding boot camps and our vocational training and all those things. We need stronger hiring partners and we need on a state and local level for there to be more incentives for people to hire more incentives within our um, apprenticeship programs and all of that. Long story short, we started our VC and residence program. Our goal uh, with Code Fever and Black Tech and everything that we're doing, the ecosystem building that we're doing, is essentially create a fund. Uh, a fund to better support and better fund early stage ideas. Derek and I joke around all the time, it's like, we talk about friends and family rounds, right? Well, what happens when your friends and family can only give you a round of applause and a round of applause? Like, what do you do? Where do you go? What if your city, what if you, not just your family, but what if your community can't do that for you? How do we retain talent? How do we retain the best startups? How do we retain the best companies? If we're not focused on making sure the quality of life is great for the people that we have here, so that those companies that we bring in actually have people that are happy to come to work. There's so many things that we can do, right? And so in order for get, in order for our whole communities to have the luxury to innovate, basic Maslow's needs need to be met. 
And if those things aren't met, we're, and we're like, where are they? But they don't have the luxury to innovate because basic needs need to be taken care of. And so we started the VC in Residence program as a, like a stopgap between raising the fund and the momentum of what we're doing. And we said we can look at the entrepreneur in residence model, right? Universities have them, municipalities have them, all across the United States. And what if we, instead of an entrepreneur in residence, we found one of America's leading VCs and we brought him to Miami for a one month residency? Because before you get to the funding issue for a lot of our startups, there's the access issue, right? Mm -hmm. And most VCs will say, and they're, we love them, right? We love them, we love their money, we love them being a part of the ecosystem. But most of them will say, I need an introduction before I talk to this person. And if you already come from a group that, does, that has a really crappy uh, network, how do you ever get the introduction to meet with this person? And so we can talk about funding all day long, but the access issue is always going to come back over and over and over again. And so we started VC in Residence to address that issue. And so most of our work for the past few years has been heavily funded by the Knight Foundation, as well as some other partners, Comcast, Morgan Stanley, BET, Intel. And we presented this idea to Knight Foundation. And as one, they didn't really get it at the very beginning. I'll be very candid and honest, right? And not until they saw the program and they really understood the access issue that we were addressing, they got it, right? And Marlon Nichols used to be in uh, VC with Intel. He's now with Cross Culture Ventures, became our, our first VC in residence. One month residency, brought him here, hosted him here in Miami, and then opened up an ap application process to any entrepreneur that was past the idea stage, right? They had started it up, they had a little bit of traction, they were at a point where they could have a very serious conversation with an investor. They would digest whatever they said to them, good or bad, and we gave them unprecedented access to a VC over four weeks. And what happens when you do that is that VC opened up his Rolodex and we were flying in other VCs almost every week. And not only did they get office hours with him, but they got office hours with a ton of bad-ass people within his network. And if you didn't get accepted into the program, we also had what we call fireside chats. And so anyone was able to come to that with access. And moreover, solving problems really quickly instead of taking all this time when people are going through what they're going through, right? How can we solve these problems faster in our community. VC in residence, entrepreneur in residence, programmers in residence. Like, it's not rocket science. The resources that we can bring to our communities, right? Moreover, so people build in their communities. And they don't think that they have to leave their house, leave their block, leave their neighborhood, leave West Palm Beach and come go to Miami. How do we build in our communities and support our communities? And that way, the people that live there have buy-in to the community because then they start to see value. The next thing that we start to do, which is taking us two years, is our big mission of ours is really communities of innovation residents, specifically black communities of innovation residents. And so we're all very familiar with food deserts, right? 23.6 million people across the United States live in food deserts. That means that they have to travel miles, oftentimes, in order, in order to get access to fresh fruit and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Over 50 million people in the United States are, live, um, are economically distressed, meaning that they live in innovation deserts. So communities like this, coding boot camps, digital literacy, access to funding, mentorship, you know, just random innovation hubs and uh, idea, uh, ideation sessions, and all the stuff that we know, right, that are within our reach to us, people across the United States live in innovation deserts. These things don't happen in their communities. It's not a part of the conversation. The resources aren't there. So how do we all come together and come up with solutions to ready communities in innovation deserts? And so we set out two years ago to open up a co-working space in a in an innovation desert in Miami, <laughs> specifically over town. Miami has 13 targeted urban areas. Um, Liberty City is, I guess, kind of high on that list with the, last time, I think it was like a 
$24,000 household income, right? In the United States, guys? So we, let's start with the working space in overtime. Right in front of Jackson Soul Food, if you're familiar with, with overtime, um, it opens next month. Really cool space. Co working on the top floor, code fever, energy and activity on the bottom floor, but as well as an urban innovation lab. So if we're going back again to looking at diverse communities about what they contribute first before we look at the challenges that they have, why don't we have urban innovation labs across the United States? We know that diverse groups, especially minority population, when we're looking at our consumer base, right? We are looking at them all the time as a consumer base. They can tell us a lot about the companies that we are creating and that we need to create. One of the biggest things that the Black and Hispanic community exports is culture. When we make something cool, it becomes cool. What happens is those communities don't often understand how to monetize those things, right? So if you look at a platform like Rap Genius that raised $13 million, most of that money came from Andreessen and Horowitz. Any one of us back in the day when we were kids and we had a song that we loved, well, the tape player, right? We would listen to it, we would rewind it, we would annotate like the, um, the words and the lyrics. When the internet became functional, right? We would upload that so people knew that we were listening to the song and we wrote down all the lyrics. That's the utility of yeah, rap genius, right? And so when you talk about music and culture and all these things, that's something that these populations can export that can be extremely valuable to technology companies, especially when we all know the changing demographics of the United States. And so if